We pray. O Lord, may the meditations in all of our hearts and the words from my lips be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The text for today's meditation is the inspired Holy Word of God in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you, that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Indeed, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Amen. Diversity, inclusion, equality has become a sacred creed. A creed to those believing that any desire of the heart must be approved without reservation and judgment. This creed is pushed upon the church and attempts to make Jesus nothing more than some tolerant spiritual guru affirming all behavior, welcoming everyone, and treating sin with just a smile and a wink. The love of God has become a cloak for vice and the freedom to do what we want while claiming divine approval. We laugh at the notion of worshiping a statue, because who would worship a stone? But we have our false gods. They are in the sanctuaries of our very own hearts. Christ Jesus stands before us on the threshing floor, and he offends our prideful flesh because he makes distinctions between people. On the last day, there is no diversity beyond simple wheat and chaff. Whatever blood is in your veins, whatever race, the judge cares not. He's looking at something else on that last day. Wheat and chaff. One gets the barn, one gets fire. One lives and the other burns. That's as diverse as it gets on that last day. And our flesh is offended. We don't like the rules. We hate to be judged. We want access to heaven on our own terms, in our own way. But friends in Christ, on the threshing floor, the Son of God is not hearing arguments. He's not persuaded by the passion and tolerance of man. Any confusion over sin or even love before God is no excuse. Then time is up. The harvest is ready. It's separation time. On that day, our creeds, the church's creeds, confess. He shall come to judge the living and the dead. It's Matthew chapter 3. And already we get an image of Jesus we don't really want to see. And that is Jesus as judge. The one pursued by Herod is the one cleaning his threshing floor, separating wheat from chaff, or if you prefer Matthew 25, separating the sheep from the goats. It's pretty clear not everyone gets in, and God will not be mocked. How then are we the wheat? 
The answer resides in John's preaching, but first we observe John received no memo that good preaching means telling people what they want to hear. John is not shy about preaching judgment. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness is a cry to repent and get ready because Christ is coming to thresh. And that is more important than even friends and family liking you. John is not in it to receive the accolades of man. And his preaching doesn't wither under pressure. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they show up. But John is no reed shaken by the wind. He will not bend. He is a man sent by God. And he will preach like God. Without apology, without qualification, without flexing and bending. John is not here to itch and scratch. He's not here to bend and appease and suddenly change because men are on the scene of prestige and clout. He has been sent to preach. A man dressed like Elijah, a man of a different era, but it's God's man. You brood of vipers, he says. You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance and do not think to say amongst yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Because I say to you, God is able from these stones to raise children of Abraham. Many of us can see quite clearly the manifest and grotesque sins of the world splattered before us on every commercial and web page. All things LGBTQ slither into our homes via TV and the internet. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. That's for our children, too. Therefore, giving a child unbridled access to a smartphone or tablet and then walking away because we don't want to be bothered isn't a wise idea. It's bound to bear bad fruit. TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, all the social media platforms, friends, there is preaching there, you know. The wrong kind of preaching. They have creeds. The world has its own creeds. The devil, the devil knows how to preach. The devil knows how to persuade. If you do not believe me, go read the first seven verses of Genesis chapter 3. But there is a danger of focusing on the grotesque and manifest sins of the world, even harping on them before others. Whatever virtue you want to signal to show your own piety, it does not cover your sins, our sins. If you are not addicted to some sexual vice, God be praised. God be praised. Because many people are. But what is it? Is it gossip? Is it bearing that grudge that just won't go away? And even worse, you don't care. Is it stubbornness? Is it accumulating stuff? Is that your addiction? Worldly treasures, the fuller the barn, the more comfortable you feel. Is it what you say to other people? Do you take your grievances out on other people when you are to blame? Spouting off without thinking, being hard-headed, but bragging about it without regard for your neighbor. Well, that's just the way I am. Ever tried that one? It is no excuse. It is no excuse. It does not remove or erase God's call for you to be compassionate, patient to others, it is no excuse to simply overlook God's call that your speech be seasoned with salt. The law accuses us for such things as well. Greed, pride, selfishness. The law slays us all. And even now, says John, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. 
That law of God demands more than we can give, and it shows our poverty. It shows what we do and don't do when we put our kids on the back burner for our own pleasure and comfort. And the law also shows it when we use the doctrine of sin, original sin, to recuse ourselves from having to be bothered by the law of God. Well, since I'm a sinner, what does it really matter? There are no fruits in me, so why even try? And so it is, dear Christian friends, between legalism and abusing liberty, we stumble before God, and the law shows all of it. Whether we're trying to muster up all the works we can to earn his favor, or dismissing the law altogether, what's the point? Striving to live a Christian life is just a waste of time. Grace then becomes that sought-after license for laziness and apathy in Christian living, even though God calls us to bear fruit. We seek to be wheat, though, and the law demands more and more and more. Any any inventory of our own works is bound to disappoint. Whether it's stockpiling good deeds for approval or dismissing the law altogether under some banner of grace, our sin is not hitting before the one standing on the threshing floor. But how are we to be the wheat? In answering that question, we miss the mark if the first place, the very first place we look at, is ourselves. Already your eyes are at the wrong place. The psalmist, hear what the psalmist says. In Psalm 123, our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy upon us. John's preaching is intended to get us to look to the coming one, to look to Jesus. His preaching is to wake us from our slumber and sleep to make us prepared because of the coming one, the one who makes us whole and complete, the one who makes good trees, the one who turns stones into children. The kingdom of heaven is at near, preaches John. The kingdom of heaven is more person than place. When John says the kingdom of heaven is near, he's talking about someone. He's talking about the Christ. Stones to children, that's impossible for man. One can't make himself a child from a stone. But it is the work of God to enliven dead sinners. It's the work of God to make water in the desert, to bring out springs of water from some piece of flint. And when God, in his mercy and by his spirit, puts faith into the dead heart, God be praised for one who has been brought from stone to life, stone to child. And you look to the coming one, and you trust in the forgiveness of all sins. Greed, stubbornness, vice, and the list goes on. Covered by his blood. Covered by him. Those caught in vice and addiction are not beyond hope, so long as breath is in their lungs. The call to repentance is for them as well. Many of you have learned this all too well, as loved ones in your life have left, left the church, left the faith. And you seek their repentance with tears. You pray that they would repent and bear fruit. That's a good prayer. Keep praying it. Keep praying it. Don't lose heart. And remember the word. Remember the Holy Spirit works in his word to do great things like kill and make alive, to tear down and build up. The coming one, the one on the threshing floor, still says my words are spirit and life. Where the word is, the spirit is there, Christ is there. And that's a powerful word. That's a word that can make children from stones. No, don't lose heart. And because we... As Christian people have that word, we have every reason to be bold, like John, to speak that word, like John. Dead trees get cut down, living trees endure. Now that seems a little backwards, though, in the life of John. He was a fruitful tree, but we know what happens to him. 
His preaching lands him in jail, and ultimately he dies. But in John's preaching, he has something more in mind than temporal death. Axes hitting trees? No, the world does not like the fruitful trees before God. But John's preaching is turning us to look again to the coming one. Dead trees get the axe, the chaff goes and it burns, unquenchable fire. But the wheat, the good trees, the fruitful trees can be chopped down by the world. But you live before God. You die in Christ, but you also live in Christ. Our call to get our spiritual affairs in order, the call to pay attention to eternal judgment, is the call to look to the coming one and hear what he has done to receive what he gives. The kingdom of heaven is always at hand. And when John calls you to repent, turn from sin, yes, but there's more packed into that word. Turn from sin, yes, but believe in the one who separates the wheat from the chaff, the one who makes good trees, the one who makes children from stone. Believe in the one who would die, Believe in the one who was chopped down and put upon his own tree to shed blood. But he does it for you. And we know the story that he dies to live. You are in Christ as a baptized believer. You're not out of him. You're in him. And that means you live with him. As he lives, the church lives. And not even the gates of hell will overcome the church. Not even death will kill those who belong to Christ and live with him. As for the enemy, the enemy gets his due because recompense always belongs to God. This Advent season, this blessed Advent season, we learn again what it means to repent before our King, to turn from sin and look to him for salvation, guidance, and protection. The winnowing fan is in his hand. The wheat go into the barn the chaff go into the fire. But dear Christians, baptized into that holy name, when the day your Lord comes, that's a glorious day for you, his people. That is the day the scriptures call you to hold your head high because your salvation has drawn near. It's a day your king comes for you. Your king comes to take back what is his. It means your preparation, your readiness, your vigilance, your faithfulness, and the one who has made you a child from stone is not in vain. Because on this day when our Lord returns, he takes you from this veil of tears to dwell with himself in heaven. Amen.